through physical heredity, we bring into this world a little sum total of all of our ancestors. Now, if we happen to be born with a nice brain power, nice, well-developed, rounded-out bodies, fine. But if we happen to be born with a hunchback or some affliction, there's nothing much we can do about that. In other words, we have to take what physical heredity hands us as it is. I know a man afflicted with the loss of his legs through polio who uh, ran a peanut stand within two blocks of the White House and right in the White House, a man afflicted with the same thing was running the biggest nation in the world. And he made a, an asset out of his affliction instead of a liability. Social heredity, however, is another thing. Social heredity consists of all of the influences that enter into your life after you were born, and maybe dating back to the prenatal stage even before you were born. The things you hear, the things you see, the things you are taught, the things you are read about, the legends that you are influenced by, and all that sort of thing, constitute social heredity and by far and away, the most important part of what happens to us all the way through life is due to our relationship to social heredity, or what we get out of our environment and how much we control it. No, it's a social heredity thing. You know, it's a good idea for all of us, all adults, to go back and re-examine ourselves about these vital things that we uh, think we believe in, find out just what right we have to believe them. Where do we get our beliefs? What is there to support any belief? So help me, I, I, I don't think I have any beliefs that, that are not supported by good sound evidence, or at least what I believe to be evidence. But I didn't arrive at that open-minded state of tolerance overnight. I'll tell you that now. There was a time when I was just about as intolerant as the next one. But I found out that that was a bad thing for me, and certainly not good for my students to be, uh, have a closed mind about anything. And I wouldn't worry over them any longer than it took me to remedy them. Uh, one of my students uh, some time ago asked if I didn't uh, worry an awful lot over people who came to me with their problems. I said, other people's problems? Why, bless your life, I don't worry over my own problems. Why should I worry over somebody else's problems? And it's not because I am indifferent. I'm certainly far from indifferent. I am very sensitive to the problems of my friends and my students but not sensitive enough to let them become my problems. They're still your problems, and I'll do all I can to help you dissolve them, but not enough to absorb them and take them over myself. That's not my way of doing it. And don't you get into that habit either. There are a lot of people, you know, who not only uh, make room in their makeups for all of their own problems, but they take on the problems of all their in-laws and their relatives and their friends and the neighborhood, and sometimes the problems of the whole nation. Worry was made for somebody else, not for me. And don't look for trouble. It will find you in its own way too soon anyway. Don't go looking for it. Now, because uh, the circumstances of life have a queer way of revealing to you the thing you're searching for. If you're looking for faults in other people, or if you're looking for trouble, or if you're looking for things to worry about, you'll always find them. And you don't have to go very far. You don't have to go out of your own house to find a lot of things to worry about if you're looking for things to worry about. A person without hope is lost. Sound health inspires hope, and hope inspires sound health. Now, what do I mean by hope? I mean the hope of some yet unattained objective in life, something that you're working toward, something that you're trying to do, and you know you're going to do it. And you're not going to be worried because you're not doing it fast enough. You know, there are a lot of people in this world who start out to be rich. They want to make a lot of money, and they're impatient, become nervous, work themselves into a fury because they don't get the money fast enough. Sometimes this desire to get money quickly influences people to get it the wrong way. And that's not good. Uh, develop hope by daily prayer, not for more blessings, but for those you already have, such as freedom as an American citizen. What a marvelous thing it would be to express prayer every day in one form or other, in your own words, or don't need to use any words at all, just in your own thoughts. Express a prayer of appreciation for the freedom that you enjoy as an American citizen. Freedom to be ourselves, freedom to live our own lives, freedom to have our own objectives, freedom to make our own friends, 
freedom to vote as we please, to worship as we please, and to do pretty much anything else we please, even abuse ourselves by wrong living if we want to do it that way. Then the privilege of acting on our own initiative and a job that is secure from war hazards at the present time. We think that there's not any danger of war at this time. There may be some time later on, but right now there isn't. And then an opportunity to secure economic freedom according to your talents and freedom to worship in your own way, sound physical and mental health, and the time that lies ahead of you. Think of the marvelous thing that consists in the time that still lies ahead of you. Well, you know, the richest part of my life and of my achievements is still ahead of me. I'm still just a youngster in the midst. I've uh, been going to kindergarten. I'm up going to the graded school now in my profession. But I'm going to do some really good work before I pass on. I'm not, I am making better use now of my time than I used to. Time is a precious thing. I evaluate it in terms of minutes now. And throw away your aspirin and your headache tablets. First thing you do. Headache is nature's way of warning you that something needs correction. Headache, the headache is one of the most marvelous things in the world. It's a wonderful thing. We couldn't get along without headaches. Why, well, we die too young. Well, headache is nothing in the world but nature telling you that there's some trouble somewhere and you better get busy and do something about it. Did you know that physical pain is one of the miraculous and marvelous things of all of nature's creations? Physical pain, it's a language that every living creature on the face of this earth, of every person, of every nationality, understands. It's the only universal language. Language of physical pain. Every living creature begins to do something when physical pain begins to clamp down on. Because it is a form of warning. And take no purgatives of any sort at any time. That's a bad habit. And remember, sound health does not come from bottles, but it may come from fresh air, wholesome food, wholesome thinking, and living habits, all of which is under your control. Fat people may be good-natured, but they generally die too young, and I don't like to see people dying too young. Fasting, here is one of my pets. Now, if you want to know one of the ma main secrets why I have such marvelous health, why I have no ailments, why I have lots of energy, it's because <laughs> twice a year I go on a 10-day fast. 10 days without any food of any nature whatsoever. I condition my physical body through two days of preparation by fruits, fruit juices, nothing but live vital elements going into the body. Then I go on my fast of water, nothing but just plain water, all the water I can drink, but I put enough uh, flavoring or lemon juice or something in it, just a few drops to uh, take the flatness out of water because believe you me, when you're fasting, water will taste mighty flat. And then when I come off of my fast for the first two days afterwards, I take a very light diet, very little of it. The first day, only one small bowl of soup with no grease in it and one slice of whole wheat bread. Now, don't you start fasting just because I said so. And don't you start fasting at all until you learn under the directions of a doctor or somebody skilled in fasting how to do it and why to do it. I recommended a fast to one of my students once who was about 75 pounds overweight. And she said, you mean fast for 10 days? Well, I'd starve to death the first day. I would starve to death the first day if you took food away from me. And I believe she meant it, and she probably would. The person got lost in the woods, scared to death. I suspect they could starve to death in two or three days. Believe you me, there is tremendous therapeutic value, tremendous spiritual value, tremendous economic value in learning the art of fasting. And on work. Well, work must be a blessing because God provided that every living creature must engage in it in one way or another or perish. Isn't that a marvelous thing to think about? Talk about the birds of the air and the beasts of the jungle, neither wind is spinning nor sowing nor reaping, but nevertheless they, they have to work before they can eat, just the same. Work should be performed in the spirit of worship as a ceremony. What a wonderful thing it would be if you would uh, look at your work as the rendering of useful service. Think uh, not in terms of what you're getting out of it, but in terms of the people that you're helping as a result of what you're doing in life. Did you know that when you're engaged in a labor of love, when you're doing something for somebody just because you love that person, or he's a friend of yours, you're not uh, doing it for money, do you know you, you never feel tired when you're doing that kind of work? And it does something for you. You get your compensation as you go along. I want to tell you that this business of going the extra mile is the most wonderful thing in this philosophy. 
But what it will do to you is you go along. It makes you feel better. Better towards yourself, better towards your neighbor, and uh, gives you a better standing in the world of hell. Your work should be based on the hope of achievement of some definite major purpose in life. Thus it becomes voluntary, a pleasure to be sought, and not a burden to be endured. Work with a spirit of gratitude for the blessings it provides, both in sound physical health and economic security, and the benefits it may provide one's dependence, thus in embellishing it with love. And then faith. Learn to communicate with infinite intelligence from within and adapt yourself to the laws of nature as they are in evidence all around you. And that's one of the greatest systems of therapeutics that I know anything about. It's an abiding and an enduring source of faith. It does wonderful things to your physical body. And believe you me, if there does happen to creep in ailments, legitimate ailments, I know of no better medicine to take than faith. And then habits. All habits are made permanent and work automatically through the operation of the law of cosmic habit force, which forces every living thing to take on and to become a part of the environmental influences in which it exists. You may fix the pattern of your thought habits and your physical habits, but cosmic habit force takes these over and carries them out. Understand this law and you will know why the hypochondriac enjoys poor health. If you ever have financial security in this world, you've got to do two things, at least. You've got to budget your time, the use of your time, and you've got to budget your money, your expenditures and your receipts, so that you have a definite plan to go by. Now, to begin with, you have 24 hours of time. Let's take up time first. You have 24 hours divided into three eight-hour periods, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for work, well, you have no control over the eight hours for sleep. You have to give that over to nature. She demands that. And you don't have uh, always uh, too much control over the eight hours that you put into work. Even though you're working for yourself, you still don't have too much control. You have to be there. But there are eight hours that bless your lives. That's, uh, that's yours. You can waste it if you want to. You can play. You can work. And you can enjoy yourself. You can relax. Or you can develop by taking courses of instruction. You can read. You can do anything you want to with it. And therein lies the greatest opportunity of the whole 24 hours. It used to be, back in the days when I was doing my research, I worked 16 hours a day, but it was a labor of love that I was engaged in. I reserved eight hours a day for sleep, and the other 16 I worked. Part of the time I was working in order to make a living, training salesmen and so forth, but mostly in research, getting ready to give this philosophy to the world. And had it not been for the fact that I had at least eight hours of free time of my own, I never could have done the necessary research. Now, in those eight hours of spare time, you can practice developing uh, all of those habits that you choose through the law of cosmic habit for us. Now, you don't have to follow my plans, but you'll get some mighty good ideas in the lesson on applied faith, in the one on cosmic habit for us and in the one on uh, the mastermind. Work out a plan of your own, and if it's your plan, it'll be better than if I give it to you verbatim and you just follow it. Now, the suggestions for budgeting of time, uh, uh, budgeting of income and expenses. First thing on your uh, list, your monthly or weekly amount of income should put down, be put down. You should have a regular book worked out, a budgeting book. Now, if you have a family or if you don't have a family, a life insurance is a must. It's absolutely a must. You just cannot afford to be without it. If you, have, if you brought children into this world who are responsible for, to whom you are responsible for an education, it's up to you to insure yourself so that if you pass out of the picture and you don't earn any longer, they have got enough money to educate themselves with. That's just a must. And if you've married a wife that's dependent entirely upon you, it's up to you to uh, carry enough insurance to give her a, a down payment on a second husband if you should pass out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but life insurance is a wonderful thing because uh, it gives you such wonderful protection in case uh, you are taken away from your source of production. And a family man or a man that's in business where his uh, services are a large portion of the assets. There are men like that, you know, in jobs or in the business where the, a key man or key men 
If taken away, it would be a tremendous loss to the business. And the men like that should always carry themselves, be insured for a large sum of money, large enough to give, uh, uh, to fill up the chasm and be left by them if they should be taken out. So life insurance comes up to the top of the list. Then next, uh, a definite percentage for food, clothing, and housing. Now, don't just go out and blow the works. You know, you can go down to the grocery store and you can spend five times as much as you actually need if you don't watch, if you don't have a system to go by. I do the shopping at our house, believe it or not. I, Annie Lou doesn't do that. I do it. That way I get what I want. <laughs> 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 but you know, I learned, I learned a great deal about shopping by following the housewives that I knew, found out were good shoppers and asking them questions. And believe you me, they put me on to a lot of things that I didn't know about buying food about handling food after the buy. And uh, so when I go over to one of those big supermarkets out in California, I always uh, pick out the most likely housewife, and I follow along behind her and start asking her questions. You'd be surprised how cooperative they are. They just love to tell you about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. <laughs> food and clothing. But uh, now we don't have a... I must say that on this one item, we don't have a budget to go by. I buy whatever I whatever my fancy strikes me. But uh, I just happen to be in a position where a budget on food and clothing is not necessary. But there was a time when it was necessary, and I imagine in the lives of most people it is necessary to have a, a budget. And then uh, a definite amount to be set aside for investment, even if it's only a small amount, if it's only a dollar a week, even 50 cents a week. It's not the amount that you set aside, it's the habit of being uh, resourceful and frugal. It's a wonderful thing to be frugal, not to waste things. And I've always admired anybody that uh, doesn't waste things. I even like, uh, like my grandfather. He used to go around picking up old nails and strings and pieces of metal, and you'd be surprised at what a collection of things he had. <laughs> now, I, my frugality never ran to that extent. <laughs> it ran more to Rolls Royces and 600 acre estates. <laughs> But believe you me, I got around at long last at learning that no matter how much of this philosophy you have, if you don't uh, have a system for saving a part of what goes through your hands, it makes no difference how much goes through, does it? And if you don't have that system, it will go through all of it. <laughs> Whatever amount remains after you have taken care of those three items should go into a current checking or spending account for emergencies, recreation, education, etc. You can draw on that. Uh, you don't have to follow your budget on that. In other words, that's a a petty cash account, you might say. And uh, if you're a real frugal, you let it get up to pretty good size. You won't keep it down too slow all the time. And it's a nice thing, you know. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that uh, you have a good, uh, good nest egg lying in the bank or in your savings account? No matter what happens, uh, you go out and go down there and get the money. You may not need it. And the chances are it'll put you in that frame of mind where you won't have to go down and get it. If you've got it. But if you don't have it there, believe you me, you'll have a thousand needs. <laughs> And you'll be afraid in connection with all of them, won't you? Yeah. That's right. I, I think perhaps the thing that gives me the most courage to speak my piece and to be myself and to m demand that my people keep off of my toes is the fact that I, ha I no longer have to worry where my money's coming from. I just don't have to worry about that. I have no money worries. In fact, I don't have any worries at, at all. The people try to worry me sometimes, but they, it's like the... Confucius say when rat tries to pull cat's whiskers, rat generally winds up in honorable cat's belly. Well, I'll give you a little time on that one. <laughs> Now, um, this system of trapping a little bit of a percentage that goes through your hands, it's not the amount that, uh, that I'm so interested in as the fact that you're establishing a frugal savings habit. And if your uh, wages or income is so low that you can't cut your expenses anymore, and you can only absolutely take out of the top, off of the top, one percent, one cent out of every dollar. Take that one cent off and put it away in some place where it's hard for you to get at it. I'm a great believer in having money invested in the investment trusts, where they represent a great variety of uh, well-known stocks, so that if one goes bad, why it doesn't affect your investment at all. 
There are a lot of those investment trusts. Some of them are good and some of them not so good, perhaps. But if you go to invest in an investment trust, you ought to go to your banker or somebody that is acquainted. Don't try to do that on your own judgment. The individuals, as a rule, are just not qualified for doing that. But get, your, get some of your money to working for you, and you'll be surprised at what a nice game it is when you know that you're setting aside a certain amount every month or every week, and that that amount is beginning to work for you. This business of trapping the money, by that I mean uh, getting it in a place where you uh, can't reach down in your pocket and get it. When I go to the bank, to, I go to the bank every so often to get money, to oh, pocket money. And I always take a $20 bill, I, what, no matter what, other, what amount I get, I take a $20 bill and wrap it up and put it in a little special pocket in my wallet, just in case I happen to run out of money. I'll always have $20. <laughs> And believe you, the other day I needed it, too. <laughs> it came in very handy. Otherwise, I'd have had to cash a check uh, with somebody who didn't know me too well, and I wouldn't have liked to ask to have that done. Saving money, you know, is a very difficult thing for most people because they don't have any system to go by. First of all, on the choice of a profession or occupation, how much time are you giving to that? How much thought and time have you given to the question of getting yourself adjusted in an occupation or a business or a profession that can be a labor of love? How much time are you devoting to doing that? Now, you can grade yourself on all of these. The grading could run all the way from zero up to 100. Of course, you're not giving 100% of your time on this first item. But uh, if you haven't already found the profession or the occupation that can constitute a labor of love, then you uh, should put in a lot of time searching until you do find that. Then the habits of thought. How much do you put in on the can-do sort of thinking, and on the, how much do you put in on the no-can-do? In other words, how much time do you put in on what you desire and on what you don't desire? Have you ever stopped to take inventory to see just about how much goes in on the, time, on the things that you don't desire in life? Fear, ill health, frustration, disappointment, discouragement. I'll bet you'd be surprised if you had a stopwatch that you could... Uh, you could record the time that you put in every day on worrying about things that, uh, that uh, might happen to you but never do. You'd be surprised at how much of your time goes. A little here and a little there and a little the other place. And the first thing you know, the predominating part of your portion of your time is going to thinking about things you don't want. Unless you have a system, a budgeting system, whereby you keep your mind definitely fixed on the things you do want. I have three hours a day set aside for meditation. Silent prayer and meditation, three hours. It doesn't make any difference what to hour, usually when I go home from these lectures. No matter what hour I get home, I'll put in three hours of meditation, giving, expressing gratitude for the marvelous opportunity that I've had to be of ministry to other people. And if I don't get it in at night, I get it in sometime during the day. Just expressing gratitude. Do you know the finest prayer on the face of this world is not to pray for something? Pray for what you already have. O oh, divine providence, I ask not for more riches, but more wisdom with which to make better use of the riches I already have. What a wonderful thing that is. Oh, you have so many riches, all of you. You have health. You live in a wonderful country. You have wonderful neighbors. You belong to a wonderful class. You're studying a wonderful philosophy. Think of all the things you have to be thankful for. <laughs> Just think of the things that I have to be thankful for. It's no wonder I'm rich, is it? Why, there'd be something wrong with me if I weren't rich. If I couldn't stand here and tell you that I have everything in this world that I want, there'd be something wrong with me and this philosophy, wouldn't there? I'd have no right to teach it to you whatsoever if I couldn't say that myself about it. I can be the master of my fate to captain of my soul, because I live by philosophy, because it's designed to help other people, because never under any circumstances do I do anything intentionally to hinder or harm or endanger another person. Never do. And then your uh, business and personal relationships to other. How much time do you put into, to, uh, into uh, public relations, you might say, or goodwill building in your relationships with other people in business or in your job. You spend some little time cultivating people, 
If you don't, you're not going to have friends. You really won't. Out of sight, out of mind. I don't care how good the friend is. If you don't keep contact, he'll forget about you. <laughs> You've got to keep contact. Some of these days, I'm going to get up a series of postcards that'll just take two cents to mail each one. And we'll have a beautiful uh, motto of friendship on each one so that my students can have those cards and uh, mail out uh, one a week to each of their friends just to keep in contact. <clears throat> That wouldn't be a bad idea for a business house or a professional man. There'd be nothing in the world to hinder a professional man from building up a wonderful client deal by doing that very thing. And he certainly would never violate the ethics of his profession by doing it. There'd be no commercial atmosphere in it at all. He's only sent out one a month. He'll send out 12 cards a year with the right kind of message on the back of it, signed by himself. Believe you me, it would, it would be the best thing in the world to build up his practice. But then the habits of health, physical and mental. How much time are you putting into uh, seeing to it that you are building health habits that uh, keep to give you health consciousness? Because a health consciousness doesn't just grow for, without some effort. And your religion, how, how much of time are you putting into living your religion? I don't mind, I'm not talking about believing in it. And I'm talk, not talking about going to church and putting a quarter in the basket now and then. Anybody can do that. How much are you living it in your bedroom and in your drawing room and in your kitchen and in your place of business and in your office? There's where I want to know how much you're living your religion. When you, when you grade yourself on that, that's the place to grade yourself. Not in the church. Because the chances are you go to church once a week, maybe more. If you belong to some religions, you have to go more. But uh, it's not how many times you go either that counts. It's not how much you contribute to the church in the way of money that counts. It's what you do to live that religion. That's the thing that counts in the everyday way of living. Why, you know, any of the religions would be wonderful if you'd only live by them instead of just believe in them. It'd all be wonderful. I don't know of a religion on the face of this earth. It wouldn't be wonderful if people lived by it. Now, it may seem trite my asking you to grade yourselves on how much time you're spending in on living your religion, but believe you me, unless uh, you're very different from most people that I know, uh, you need to reflect on this subject. And then the use made of your spare time. There is why you really need to go to town and examine yourself. Really give yourself an accounting on that one. Just how much of that eight hours of spare time are you devoting to some sort of advancement of your interests? Improvement of your mind? Benefiting by association? Just how much are you doing? And then uh, the budgeting your spending of money. Have you got a system for doing that? If you haven't got a system, work out for one. You can make that system flexible. It may be some weeks when you have to, have to cheat a little bit. But you can always pay it back the next week when you don't have to cheat. Then on accurate thinking, based on the lesson on this episode, how much time are you putting into actually learning how to think accurately, following the, the rules that I laid down in that lesson? How much are you doing to put that lesson into uh, actual practice? Thinking accurately, doing your own thinking for once. Then the use made of the power of thought, whether controlled or uncontrolled. Are you controlling your thoughts or are your thoughts uncontrolled? Are you letting the circumstances of life control you or are you trying to create some circumstances that you can control? Now, you can't control all of them. Nobody can do that. But you certainly can create some circumstances that you can control. And how about this privilege of voting? Yes or no? Or do you uh, say, oh, well, I guess I'll not go to the polls today. The crooks are going to run the country anyway, the politicians, and I, uh, my little vote's not going to count. Or do you say that, or do you say, I have a responsibility, and I'm going to go to the polls and vote because it's my duty to do that? Put a little time in on that, do you? There are a lot of people who don't, you know, and that's why there's so many uh, crooked politicians and uh, others in public office that shouldn't be there. there are too many of the decent people that don't vote. Then family relationships, are they, har are they harmonious? Do you have a mastermind relationship or are you just letting that one slide by? How much time are you giving to, to, build, to improving your family relationship? You have to do something about it, you know. Somebody has to give in. If the wife won't give in, start a while. Why don't you give in, gentlemen? And vice versa. If the husband doesn't give in, start a little masterminding. Why don't you give in? Why don't you make it interesting for him? You made it interesting for him before you married him. I'm sure you did or he wouldn't have married you. Why don't you try it all over again and re, uh, re 
renegotiates your marriage relationship so that you have a wonderful relationship there. My, believe you and me, it'll pay off. It'll pay off in peace of mind. It'll pay off in dollars and cents. It'll pay off in friendships. It'll pay off in every way that you want to judge it. Then uh, you and your job or your business or your profession, are you going the extra mile and do you like your work? If you don't uh, like your work, uh, find out why. If you're going the extra mile, how much are you going the extra mile? In what ways are you doing it? And are you doing it in the right sort of mental attitude? And believe you me, I don't care who you are or what you're doing. If you make it your business to go the extra mile in connection with every person where you can possibly do it, the time will come and you will have so many wonderful friends that whatever it is you want to carry out to them, they'll be there at your beck and call. I don't care where you go, you might search this world over and you'll never find a mar marvelous relationship than I have with you wonderful people here in this class, and you proved it here tonight. And I worked at it in order to get it. I wanted to earn it. I wanted to deserve it. If I didn't deserve it, you wouldn't have given it to me, would you? People just don't applaud like that with their hands and their heads. They applaud with their hearts. And that's the kind of applause that I appreciate. I shall often say to Annie Lou, Annie Lou takes life a little bit more seriously than I do. She works some now and then at things that she doesn't particularly like. I don't do that. I won't do anything I don't like to do. But uh, we, we are in a wonderful situation. We have wonderful health. When you see her, you know that. I won't need to tell you. She's a wonderful person, just the woman I should have had doing a wonderful job playing opposite me in this great uh, theater of life. And uh, we have everything in the world we can use or need, and if we, don't have, if we want more of anything, we all have to just pick our fingers and here it comes running from a million different sources. Don't think for a moment we could have had that on any other basis than that we first deserved it, we earned it, and we couldn't have had it without it. And nobody can have anything in this world worth having without first earning it. If any of you happen to be uh, students of Emerson, if you've read the law of compensation, you'll uh, get the sum and the substance of this lesson very much more quickly, and you'll also get more out of it. After I had read Emerson's essays for ten years, especially uh, the one on compensation, and finally had interpreted it, what he was talking about, I said uh, that someday I would rewrite that uh, particular essay so that men and women could understand it the first time they read it. And the lesson that you get tonight is that rewrite. We call it the law of cosmic habit force because it is the uh, controlling force of all of the natural laws of the universe. You know, we have many natural laws, and obviously they all work automatically. Obviously, they're not suspended for one moment for anybody. And uh, those laws are laid down so that uh, the individual who makes it his business to understand them and adapt himself to them can go very far in life, and those who do not understand them and adapt themselves to them uh, go down in defeat. Uh, you've often wondered about this subject of habits, how we happen to have habits, how we get them, how we get rid of the ones we don't want. And I hope that you'll get a fleeting glimpse tonight of the answer to these questions. You, of course, know I have repeated time and time again the importance of recognizing that man has control over but one thing, and one thing only, and that's the privilege of forming his own habits, tearing down those habits, and replacing them with others, refining them, changing them, doing anything in the world that he wants to do with them. And he has that complete prerogative, and he's the only creature on the face of this earth that has that privilege. Every other thing that comes into life has its pattern, its life pattern, and its destiny fixed for it. And it cannot go one iota beyond that pattern. We call it instinct. A man is not bound by instinct. He's bound only by the imagination and the willpower of his own mind. He can project that willpower and that mind to whatever objective he pleases. He can form whatever habits he may need in order to take him toward his objectives. And this lesson that you're on tonight deals with that subject. The purpose of the science of success, of uh, course, which you've been studying, incidentally, in the previous lessons, are based uh, and, and designed to enable one to establish habits that lead to financial security, health, and peace of mind necessary for happiness. 
In this lesson, we examine briefly the established law of nature, which makes all habits permanent to everything else except mankind. Now, there's no such a thing as a permanent habit for man, because he can establish his own habits. He can change them at will. You know, that's a marvelous thing when you stop to consider that the Creator gave you complete control over your mind and gave you a means of making use of that control. And this law of, of cosmic habit force is the means by which you set the pattern of your own mind and direct it to whatever objective you choose. Now, the, uh, some of the habits uh, which are fixed by cosmic habit force and which are not uh, subject to suspension or to circumvention are, the, first of all, the stars and the planets as they are established in their fixed course. Is it a wonderful thing to contemplate all of those millions, billions, quadrillions, and trillions of planets and stars out there in the heavens, all going along according to the system, never colliding, so precise in the system that the astronomers can uh, determine hundreds of years in advance the precise relationship of uh, given stars and planets. Isn't it a marvelous thing to recognize that all of that is uh, uh, carried on according to a system? You know, um, uh, if the Creator had to hang out those stars and watch everything every night, he'd be a very busy fellow. Now, he's not going to do that, I don't think. He's got a better system. He's got a system that works automatically. If you learn what those laws are, you can adapt yourself to them and profit by them. If you don't learn what they are, you'll uh, probably, through ignorance or neglect, you will suffer by them. I notice that the majority of people, not recognizing that there is a law of cosmic habit force, go all the way through life using this marvelous law. What for? To bring prosperity and health and success and peace of mind? No. To bring poverty and ill health and frustration and fear and all of those things that people do not want by keeping their mind on those things. And cosmic habit force picks up those habits of thought and makes them permanent. That is, until I come along and break them up with this science of success philosophy. And that's just why you're here. <laughs> Mr. Stone and I had a very charming lady in our office last week wanting to sell us some space or something in a book that she was getting out based upon the birth dates of people. She wanted to know what my birth date was. And Mr. Stone didn't let her get very far with her story because he told her that he would have nothing to do whatsoever with any system or book that presupposed that uh, birth date had anything to do with what happened to one in life. And when he got through, she, uh, he said, now I can't speak for Napoleon Hill, but uh, that's my decision. And I said, well, you just made my speech now, Mr. Stone. I don't care what uh, star you were born under. I don't care what under favorable, unfavorable circumstances you may have met with in life. I don't care what happened to you in the past. I do know that I can take you, and if you follow my instructions, you can get from where you are now to where you want to go, and you'll get there easily. I know that. And I know that you can set up habits that will make your success so easy, you'll wonder why in the world you worked so hard in the past and got so, didn't get so far. You know, most people work harder at failing in life than, than I work at succeeding, a whole lot harder. It's much easier to succeed when you learn the rules and a lot more pleasure in it than it is to fail. And you certainly are not going to succeed unless you understand this law of cosmic habit hopes and start building habits that lead to where you want to go. All actions and reactions of matter are based upon the fixed habits of cosmic habit force. Have you ever stopped to think of it? That the very smallest particles of matter all exist as a result of habits that are fixed upon. And the perpetuation of every living thing through the sex principle. Each seed reproduces its own kind, but each individual reproduction is modified by the vibrations, that is, the environmental influences of the environment in which it exists. Thought habits of individuals are automatically fixed and made permanent by cosmic habit force. Now, there is one for you to think about. Thought habits of individuals are automatically fixed. Whether you will it or not, the thoughts that you give uh, expression to are going to be fixed into habits. You don't need to worry about it. If you uh, keep your mind on the things that you want to become a habit, cosmic habit force will take over from there on out. The individual creates the pattern of his thoughts by repetition of thought on a given subject, 
But the law of cosmic habit force sticks these patterns and makes them permanent unless they are broken up by the will of the individual. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if we couldn't break habits? And when I see the number of people smoking cigarettes nowadays, I'm beginning to think maybe they can't break that habit. When I see all the publicity that the magazines and newspapers give them about the death, high death rate of lung cancer due to, to cigarettes, I'm wondering whether or not people can break the cigarette habit. Well, don't get mad about it. I don't smoke either. <laughs> Something to think about, though, isn't it? You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, friends. If you want to go ahead and get lung cancer, smoking cigarettes, that's your business. I haven't a thing in the world to say about it. Well, I want to give you a little test that might be helpful. If you can't start out tomorrow morning and prove that you, your willpower is stronger than a little pinch of tobacco in a little piece of silk paper, then you want to begin working on your willpower right away and re-educating it. When I quit smoking, I laid my pipes down. I told Annie Lou to take them and throw them away. I wouldn't be needing them. She said, put them away until you call for them. I said, put them, throw them away. I'll not be needing them. Habits? Well, if you can't get control of the habit of smoking, it's going to be very difficult for you to get control of some of these other habits of fear and of poverty and of other things that you're allowing your mind to dwell upon, too. When I have some enemies to deal with, I always take the biggest guy first. When I lick him, then the rest of them usually take their tails between their legs and run. And if you've got some habits you want to break, don't start with the little easy ones. Anybody can do that. Start with the big ones, the ones that you want to do something about. Take that pack of cigarettes that you have in your handbag there, ladies, or in your pocket, gentlemen. Hey, it's smoked up now, and when you go home, put it upon the dresser. Say, look here, fellow. You may not know it, but I'm more powerful than you are, and I'm going to prove it by not, uh, by not going into that package again. I'm going to st sit there for 40 days, after which I won't need cigarettes anymore. Now, I don't think that I am uh, uh, talking against uh, the cigarette business. You know, I, after all, I don't have any stock in the cigarette gun. I am just giving you some ideas through which you must start testing your capacity to build the kind of habits that you want by starting with the tough ones. I'll give you another habit. If you'll uh, go on a week's fast, a whole week without any food. Tell your stomach that you are the boss. It may think it's the boss, but you are the boss. Now don't do this on your own. Do it under the directions of a, of a doctor because fasting is not anything for not child's play. Get control over your stomach, and you'll be surprised at how many other things you have control over when you have control over your stomach. You know, how in the world can we expect to be successes in this world if we are going to allow all these myriad habits that come along through the circumstances of our daily life to take hold of us and rule our lives? We can't expect to be successes. We have to form our own habits long enough until cosmic habit force takes them up automatically. Now, let's uh, take up the question of how the individual may apply the law of cosmic habit force. First, in connection with physical health. The individual may contribute to the healthful maintenance of his physical body by establishing habit patterns in connection with the following subjects, and there are four of them. And it's not very difficult to do this. If you want to prove the soundness and the potency and the effectiveness of this law of cosmic habit force, here is a mighty fine place on page two to start in. Because I don't know of anything in this world that men and women want any more than to have a good, strong, physical body that responds to every need in life. I couldn't do the kind of work that I do. I couldn't write the inspirational books. I couldn't to deliver inspirational lectures if I didn't know that when I put my foot on the gas, so to speak, that there's going to be power there. And no matter how steep the hill or how long, I know that I've got plenty of power to go the full distance because I keep my body in that kind of condition. First of all, in connection with your thinking, that's the place to start in connection with applying cosmic habit force for the purpose of developing sound health. Now, a positive mind leads to the development of what is known as a health consciousness. You know what a health consciousness is? What is it? 
Just what do, I, what do I mean when I talk about a health consciousness or a prosperity consciousness or any other kind of a consciousness? An awareness, a continuous awareness of a condition, don't you know? In other words, a predominating tendency of your mind to think about health and not about disease or ailments. Now, most people, they have... Uh, they have a wonderful time telling about their operations. I had a very good friend of mine visit me not more than six months ago, and he had just come out of the hospital. And I want to tell you that he, his vivid description of his operation was such that I could feel this, the surgeon's scalpel turning in my back. Yeah, I finally turned around and rubbed my back. It began to hurt back there where he was describing. It really did before I got myself under control. But I didn't ask him to come back to see me again when he left. And uh, most people don't like to hear you talk about your ailments. They're not interested in your ailments. Uh, you ought not to be either, except to get rid of them. And the best way to get rid of them is to form a health consciousness. Think in terms of health. Talk in terms of health. Look in the glass a dozen times a day and say, you healthy man or you healthy woman. Talk to yourself. You'll be surprised at what will happen. Now, the... A positive mind leads to the development of what is known as a health consciousness, and cosmic habit force carries out the thought pattern to its logical conclusion. But it will just as readily carry out the picture of an ill health consciousness created by the thought habits of the hypochondriac, even to the extent of producing the physical and the mental symptoms of any disease on which the individual may fix his thought habits through fear. Isn't that a marvelous thing to know that if you think about a certain ailment or disease long enough, the nature will actually simulate it in your physical makeup? We had down in Wise County, Virginia, an old elderly lady down in the mountain section when I was a small boy. It used to come over to my grandmother's every Saturday afternoon and sit on the front porch and entertain us all afternoon with the operations of herself, her husband, what her husband died with, what her mother died with, what two of her children died with, and then she always wound up, after about three or four hours of this, by saying, oh, I know that I'm going to die of cancer. She could put her hands on her left breast like this. I've seen her do that a dozen times. I didn't know what cancer was at the time. I found out later. Years later, some ten years later maybe, my father sent me a copy of the county paper, and I saw a, uh, an announcement of Aunt Sarah Ann Steele's death of cancer of the left breast. She finally talked herself into it. Now that's not an exaggerated case at all. It just happens to be one of the cases that I know about. You can talk yourself into a headache, you can talk yourself into a bilious condition, you can talk yourself into anything and think yourself into it if you allow your mind to dwell upon the negative sides of your physical body. So thinking is important. Now in eating, the mental attitude in and the thought patterns established while one is eating and during the following two or three hours while the food is being broken down into liquid form for introduction into the bloodstream may determine whether the food enters the body in a suitable form for the maintenance of sound health. And did you know that the mental attitude that you're in when you're eating becomes a part of the energy that goes into the, your bloodstream? Did you know that? Well, if you don't know that, you better be learning about it because it does. You can't afford to eat when you're disturbed. You just can't afford to do it. You can't afford to eat when you're too tired physically. Sit down, rest, relax. As a matter of fact, uh, food should be a form of uh, a religious uh, exercise. It should be a ceremony, a religious ceremony. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is to go out to the kitchen and squeeze, that is when I'm home, squeeze a nice, great, big, long glass of orange juice. I worship every drink, every ounce of that orange juice as it goes down. I don't just turn up a glass and go, 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 let it all go down once. I let it go down a little at a time and worship every mouthful of it. Now, if you think I'm just kidding, if you think I'm just feeling in time because I don't have anything else to say, perish the idea because I'm telling you something that's very important about your eating. And if you get into the habit of blessing your food, 
not only when you sit down to the table, but blessed as it goes into your body, if you get into the habit of doing that, I want to tell you right now, it'll go a long way towards keeping you healthy. And then third, in connection with your work. Uh, here, too, mental attitude becomes a vital ally of the silent repairman that is working on every cell of the body while one is engaged in physical action. Therefore, work should become a religious ceremony also, with which only positive thoughts are mixed. I think one of the tragedies of civilization consists in the fact that there are so few people in the world at any one time who are engaged in a labor of love. That is doing the thing they want to do because they want to do it, not because they just have to eat and sleep and rice and all. I'm hoping and praying that before I shall have crossed over on the other side, that I will have made valuable contributions to mankind to the end that individuals may find a labor of love in which to make a living and earn their way. What a grand world this would be to live in if it weren't for some of the people who live here. <laughs> and what, uh, what's wrong with some of the people? Well, I have not anything wrong with them. It's just their habits that are wrong. They think wrong. That's what's the matter with them. Let them think in terms of good health and of opulence and of plenty and of fellowship and of brotherhood instead of stirring up race riots and all of that sort of thing, setting man against man and brother against brother, nation against nation, thinking in terms of war instead of cooperation. Why, there's plenty in this world for everybody, including the squirrels and animals and birds. Plenty for everybody. If only some people wouldn't try to get too much and try to keep other people from getting enough through wrong thinking. I honestly don't want any advantage, any benefit of any nature whatsoever that I can't, that can't be shared with all of my people everywhere. I don't want anything that I can't share with people. I want no advantage over other people. Save only the opportunity of sharing with them my knowledge and my ability to help them to help themselves. Work, what a marvelous thing it is. Uh, observe that, uh, <clears throat> for instance, the ma famous Mayo brothers have discovered that four vitally important factors must be observed to maintain sound physical health. An equal balancing through thought habits of work and play and love and worship. Now, is that an interesting thing? That's authentic, can come from the great Mayo Institute where they have had thousands of people pass through their clinic. They have found out that where those four things are out of kelter, out of balance, almost invariably it results in some form of physical ailment. Observe that here enters a sound explanation of one of the major reasons for adopting and following the habit of going the extra mile. This habit not only benefits one economically, but it enables one to work with a mental attitude that leads to sound physical health. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When you're doing something out of a spirit of love, out of a spirit of desire to be of help to other people, not out of a selfish desire, it tends to give you better health and to build up better health habits. And for comparison, consider the person who has the habit of griping and performs all work grudgingly and in a negative frame of mind. Nobody wants to even work with him. And nobody wants to employ him if he can find somebody else who doesn't gripe. The fellow who gripes while he's working, not only a damages himself, but he damages everybody around him. Mr. Andrew Carnegie told me that one single negative mind in an organization of 10,000 could more or less discolor the mind of everyone in there inside of two or three days without even opening his mouth or saying anything, just by releasing thoughts. You go into a home where there's fighting between members of the family and the moment you cross the threshold, even when you get in the, I can tell when I get in the front yard whether I want to go in or not. <laughs> Well, it's safe to go in or not. And certainly after I get in there, I can tell. We have an experience in our home that's, uh, that makes me prouder than anything I can tell you about. Almost invariably, when a person walks into our home for the first time, they look around and uh, make some complimentary expression such as this. For instance, an outstanding publisher came to see me not long ago and when he walked into our living room, he said, oh, what a beautiful home. 
And then he looked around again, and after all, it was, it was just an ordinary home, and not anything outstanding about it. He said, well, the word beautiful is not just the word I want. He said, it's the way I feel when I get in here. that the vibrations are good. I said, now you're getting hot. You're getting up my alley. This home is charged and recharged constantly with positive vibrations. No inharmonies inside of this house are permitted. Even our dogs have picked that up, our little Pomeranians. They respond to the vibrations of that home. And they can tell a person that's not in harmony with that home in the moment to come in, and they don't like that kind of a person. And Sparky will go up and sniff the person, and if he's, in, uh, if he's pleased with that harmonious atmosphere, she'll go over and kiss his hand. And if she's not pleased, finds that he's not in harmony, she'll bark at him and back away. <laughs> I didn't teach her that either. It's her own idea. So homes, places of business, streets, cities, all have their own vibrations made up of the dominating thoughts of those who work and go that way. You go down Fifth Avenue in New York City, I don't care whether you, how, much, how little money you've got in your pocket, and if you walk along there with, with those big prosperous stores along about Tiffany's, you catch the feel of that crowd and you feel like you're prosperous too, although you may not have very much money. You go just four blocks over in the other direction, over to 8th Avenue or 9th Avenue in Hell's Kitchen. And I defy you to walk one block there without feeling like you were as poor as a church mouse, even though you may have all the money in the world. The economic and financial benefits. Let's see what we're going to get out of this in connection with cosmic metaphors. First of all, a definite major purpose. And through a combination of the principles of the philosophy of American achievement, one may condition his mind and body to hand over to cosmic habit force the exact picture of the financial status he wishes to maintain, and these will automatically be picked up and carried out to their logical conclusion by an inexorable law of nature which knows no such reality as failure. Now, I have observed by studying people who are successful and I've had probably more opportunity to study successful people at close range than any other man living today, I have observed that they think constantly in terms of things they can do, never in terms of things they can't do. I once asked Henry Ford if uh, there was anything he wanted to do that he couldn't do. He said, why, no, I don't think about the things I can't do. I think about the things I can do. Now, the majority of people, however, are not like that. They think about the things they can't do and worry about them. And uh, consequently, they can't do them. They think about the money they don't have and worry about it, and consequently, they don't have it and never get it. You know money is a peculiar thing, isn't it? <laughs> Somehow or another, it just doesn't follow the fellow around that doesn't believe he's got a right to get it. I don't know why that is. Money is a kind of an inanimate thing. I, I don't believe it's the fault of the money. I don't think uh, the fault's there. I think it's in the mind of the person who uh, doubts that he can get it. I notice that when the students of mine start believing that they can do things, it starts to change their entire financial condition. I notice that when they, uh, they don't believe they can do things, uh, why they... They, they don't do them. So the whole purpose of this philosophy is to induce my students to build up habits of belief in themselves and in their ability to direct their minds to whatever they want in life and to keep their minds off the things they don't want. If you, haven't, uh, if you don't know too much about Mahatma Gandhi, it'd be a good idea if you to get a book and read up the, on the life of Mahatma Gandhi. There's a man who didn't have anything to fight the British with except his own mind. He didn't have any soldiers, he didn't have any money, he didn't have any military equipment, he didn't even own a pair of britches. And yet he put to rout the great British Empire with his mind power just resisting them. He didn't want them, he didn't accept them, and finally the British picked up and they got the big idea and got out. Surprising how many individuals will do that when you set your mind against them. You don't have to say anything, you don't have to do anything, you just have to say in your own mind, I don't want that person in my life, and eventually he'll get out, sometimes very quickly. 
I'm telling you, this mind power stuff, it's powerful, it's potent, it's marvelous, it's profound. If you once become acquainted with it, then start using it. Now, this philosophy is the medium by which one's thought habits may be controlled until they are taken over by cosmic habit force. And it is well to here call attention to the fact that no one has ever been known to become financially independent without having first established a prosperity consciousness. Just as no one <coughs> may remain physically well without having first established a health consciousness. I remember so well my greatest difficulty when I started out with Andrew Carnegie. My greatest difficulty was forgetting that I was born in poverty and illiteracy and ignorance. It took me a long time to forget forget the little mountain hut in the mountains of Wyas County, Virginia, where I was born. Long time before I could forget about that and get it out of my system. And always when I'd start out to uh, interview an outstanding man, I'd think, oh well, uh, I'm so insignificant. When I come to him, into his presence, I guess I'll be ashamed and afraid because I remembered where I came from. I remembered my poverty. It was a long time before I could shake that poverty off. But finally I did it. And when I began to think in terms of opulence, I began to say then, well, why wouldn't Mr. Edison see me? Why wouldn't Mr. Wanamaker see me? Because I'm just as big in my field as he is in his. I not only felt that, ladies and gentlemen, but I saw the day when I made it come true. It's an achievement when you can reach out and influence the lives of millions of people all over the world beneficially. I say that's an achievement. And I say it never would have been done if I hadn't changed the habits and thoughts of Napoleon Hill. That was my biggest job, believe me. My biggest job was not getting in to see the men of affairs and to get their collaboration. That was easy. My biggest job was to change the habits of thinking of Napoleon Hill. And had I not changed those habits, the books that I have written that inspire millions of people never would have had the effect that they had. Because when an author writes a book or makes a speech, the exact mental attitude that he's in when he's speaking or writing is conveyed to his audience. And he no man lives who is smart enough to keep that audience from picking up the thoughts. You read a book that anybody writes and you have impressions about that writer as you read that book. And you couldn't possibly read one of my books without knowing down deep in your heart that I'm dealing with fundamental principles as fundamental as infinite intelligence itself. You know that. You don't need anybody to prove it to you. And before I could write books of that kind, I had to completely build over my thought processes, my habits of thinking, and learn to keep my mind on the things that were positive and keep it on there automatically. Fixations of fear and faith. Did you know that each one of you came over to this plane with a marvelous doctoring system of your own? Did you know that? A chemist, don't you know, that breaks up your food and distributes it, takes out of it the things that nature needs? And did you know that if you think right, eat right, exercise right, and live right, you know that, you, that, that this doctor inside of you does everything else automatically? They call it body resistance. I don't care what you call it, it's a system that nature gave you for balancing everything that you need to keep your body in fine condition all the time. But you have to do your part. Now faith, <clears throat> a fixation is a wonderful thing if it doesn't happen to be a negative fixation. But you want to look out for these fixations of fear and self-limitation, the things that you can't do, the fear of criticism or the fear of anything else. But if you want to make use of fixation and benefit by the law of cosmic habit force in doing so, go to work on the fixation of faith. Fixation of applied faith. Now there's a fixation you can tie to. And there's a fixation, if you tie to it properly, when you reach out there and call for the things you need, you'll find them always in place. If they're not where you thought they were, they'll be close at hand. By all means, cultivate that kind of a fixation. Don't let it get away from you by neglect. How do you go about uh, making a fixation of anything? Any thought habit, how do you go about it? Repetition, that's right, and applying it in everything you do and think and say. Repetition. Some of you are old enough to have remembered the Kui formula day by day in every way I'm getting better and better millions of people all over this country were saying that 
and it didn't come out to a tinker's dam, not swearing, D-A-M, a little small coin, <laughs> unless the person saying it believed it. It wasn't what he said that counted, it was what he thought while he was saying it. And there were a lot of people that said it over and over again and then finally turned thumbs down on it because they said, oh, it didn't work for me because I didn't believe in it in the first place. <laughs> you can understand why it didn't work. It makes no difference what formula you use or whether you use any oral formula or not as long as your thought patterns are positive and you can repeat them over and over again. I want you to follow the habits of thinking in positive terms until cosmic habit force takes up your my mental attitude and makes it predominantly positive and not predominantly negative. The circumstances of life are such that the majority of people have, have, their, they have their minds are predominantly negative all the time. Now what you want to do is to change all of that and make the mind predominantly positive all the time. So no matter what you want, you can turn on the power and uh, get some response from infinite intelligence. Infinite intelligence is not going to do anything for you while you're in a state of, of anger, no matter how much right you have to be angry. Infinite intelligence is not going to do anything for you, but she's going to let you do something for, to yourself if you keep yourself in a, a state of a negative mind. You can't afford to go into action. You can't afford to go into expression. You can't afford to have human relationships while you're in a, in a negative mental attitude. And the best way to keep from having uh, being in the negative mental attitude is to start to build up these positive habits and to let cosmic habit force take them over and make them predominant in your mind. Here are the negatives that you should avoid making into fixations. Poverty, imaginary illness, laziness, just plain never did any garden variety of laziness, laziness. You know what a lazy man is? He's a man who hasn't found a labor of love. That's right. No, no lazy people except those who haven't found something they like to do. Of course, some of them are pretty hard to please. <laughs> they go all the way through life and have an alibi. They don't like this, don't like that. As a matter of fact, they don't like anything, period. They are lazy. And envy and greed and anger and hatred and jealousy and dishonesty and drifting without aim or purpose. Irritability of mental attitude in general, vanity, arrogance, cynicism, sadism, and the will to injure others. Now those are things that become fixation in the lives of most people, and you can't afford to have that kind of a fixation. You just can't afford it. It's too expensive. Even as a student of uh, the science of success, I'd still say it's too expensive for you. You can't have that kind of a habit or fixation. But down here are the positives that you can't afford to have and you can't afford not to have them. The definiteness of a major purpose in life heads the list. Make it a fixation by all means. Eat it, sleep it, drink it. And indulge in some act every day of your life leading in the direction of your overall major purpose in life. And faith, personal initiative, enthusiasm, willingness to go the extra mile, imagination, the traits of a pleasing personality, accurate thinking, and all the other traits recommended in this philosophy of individual achievement. Now those are the things that you can afford to make into fixations so that they dominate your mind. You live by them. You think by them. And you act by them. You relate yourself to people by them. And uh, you'll be surprised at how quickly you can give yourselves changed lives. You'll be surprised at how quickly the people who have tried to injure you will, of their own accord, fall away and become ineffective and impotent. You'll be surprised at how potent you'll become, how you'll attract to you new opportunities. You'll be surprised at how quickly you'll solve your problems when they arise. And you wonder why you didn't do it before, instead of worrying over your problem, why you just didn't get busy and dissolve it or solve it. On every one of those, you'll notice everyone is under your control, subject to your control as a result of repetition of thought. That's all you have to do. Just keep repeating it over and over and over again and put some action about behind the thought. Words without deeds, you know, are dead. Engage in some sort of action. Now, one should develop fixations by all means, but one 
should take care to see that they are fixations on the subject of that which one wants, not that which one does not want. Isn't it a strange thing that the majority of people go all the way through life with the, uh, getting everything they don't want and very few things that they do want? Isn't that funny? You know, a lot of people who don't get the mate in marriage that they really want after they get him or her and find out about it. <laughs> you know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of people who don't get out of their jobs what they want. I know a lot of people who do not get out of their profession what they want. They'd like to have more patience and better patience with better dispositions. Incidentally, that's, uh, there's an idea. You know how a professional man, like a dentist or a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer, how, how he goes about attract, attracting a lot of patients that uh, are agreeable to get along with? Wonderful patients, pay their bills promptly and all that sort of thing. Do you know how he does it? Yeah, be that way himself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you set a mouthful. <laughs> That's the idea. In other words, the, the, the effect starts with the professional man himself. His own mental attitude toward his clients or his patients is what determines what they do toward him. No getting away from that. That's absolutely true. That happens to a merchant, happens to a man or woman in a job or any other person in any other connection. In other words, if you want to reform people, don't start with the people, start with you. <laughs> and get your mental attitude right, and you'll find that the others will fall in line. They, they, they can't do anything about it. As a matter of fact, if your, if your mind is, is positive, the negative-minded person can't influence you in the least. Nothing he can do about it. A positive-minded person is always the master of the negative-minded person. That is, if he exercises his right. We are what we are today, ladies and gentlemen, because of two forms of heredity. Now, one of them we control outright, and one of them we do not control at all. 